Uh, all those who are joining us via live streaming from around the world, will you please welcome our eChurch to church this morning? It's been an amazing few weeks talking about mind games. By the way, we're almost a full house here this morning, and I'm excited about what summer uh, is going to include, because there's always a revival in summer. There's always a revival in summer. You know, in winter, the strong of faith come to church, but by summer, uh, there's a revival. I'm excited for that. We've spent the last few weeks, three weeks, this is the last message on the series, Mind Games. And I thank you for your patience, because I had to say some stuff that wasn't always, you know, it wasn't always easy to say, but it was a powerful series, at least from my experience of it, and I hope you enjoyed the series too. Next weekend, it's Worthy Conference, and some of the international guests will be here on Sunday also, and then we'll start a new series after that. Hilton, can I ask you to help me? Would you mind if I, <laughs> always surprises, I didn't warn you, can I borrow the key? that you've got around your neck. I don't know if it, I mean, it, will I get into trouble for this in any way? It's the key to the car. <laughs> well, you can just get it. Um, they've got um, um, uh, 24 Skies, uh, Hilton's band has some albums. Um, uh, and it, this one's called First Light, uh, and this is how I actually met Hilton. He sent this to me, um, I downloaded it, got to listen to it, thought, wow, this is remarkable. Uh, made it uh, to the top of some amazing charts, and um, you can get it uh, somewhere. Where, where? Merch in Warehouse One. Merch in Warehouse One. So um, I encourage you to do that, and um, I'm wondering if somebody would like a copy of... Um, for, who was that? That was, that was... Was that you? Right in front there, dressed all swag like that? <laughs> Come get it from me, bro. You're sitting alone. Come get it. Pastor's son, I guess, you know when to say amen, right? <laughs> there you go. God bless you. It's a pleasure. Uh, um, keys are, uh, we talked a little bit about keys, so I wanted to use this as a, a conversation point around um, my last uh, message on the series. A key is a piece of steel with a lot of ups and downs cut into it. And so are you. And if we can come to terms with the fact that there are ups and downs as necessity to unlock destiny, you would celebrate them more. It in no way diminishes the power of the steel. Instead, it teaches you that you are a solution looking for a lock to unlock. So today, I'm going to do a, se a message, uh, I'll get to the title in a moment on the screen, but you'll see exactly why that illustration is so important, has been in my journey, and I hope will be in yours too. I want to do a conversation with you today on the difference between real faith and photoshopped faith. Photoshopped faith. I don't know if you've ever seen a photoshopped photo. I saw an app the other day where you could take a photo of yourself, and then you could insert abs. You could insert abs. It's just an amazing thing. You have different, and then you color blend it, you know? I mean, who needs to go to gym? There's an app for that. You just, you just need an app. I now am no longer sure that the photos I see are legit anymore. I, I'm, I'm not sure because some, some, sometimes, sometimes, when I meet the person and then the, pho and then the, per and then, <laughs> you'll see what I mean. First Peter 5, 8. Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. That's been the topic of our conversation. How do you be sober-minded? We talked about how you can be physically drunk in such a way that you can't walk straight. We talked about being sober-minded in a similar way, that you can be toxic by the influence of things like unforgiveness or anger or frustration, and you still can't walk straight. And sometimes we judge people who kind of can't walk straight in a funny way, but do you know that there are things that could be happening in your mind that cause for you to find it difficult to keep a straight line? And we wanted to take some time to eradicate that, to remove that. So today, I want to talk to you about Photoshopped faith and the real thing. Years ago, I read a book by a pastor on how he grew his church. It's quite an amazing 
story. Uh, some of you may know the guy. His name is Rick Warren. And he's got this huge church in America called Saddleback. He wrote a book called Rediscovered Church. But what I loved about the book is the first half of the book is written by the pastor, Rick. And then he gave it to his wife to read. And she said, I want to write the second half of the book. Because you didn't tell the whole story. But don't change anything in the first half. Your first half goes in as you wrote it, and then I, as the wife, will take the filters off, and I'll write what really happened. <laughs> How many of you are like, oh, Lord, I don't know if I would publish a book like that. But here, here's the reason why this is so important. It's so important because sometimes we only read from the Bible the highlights and forget that the same people in the Bible also had deep depressions, struggles, and fights. And we compare those highlights to our lives and think there's something wrong with us. And I don't know how many times you've asked yourself the question, why does this keep happening to me? Why do I keep having this kind of relationship? Why do I keep having that kind of outcome? I want to show you today, it keeps happening until you find the key that unlocks that thing and God takes you to the next level. It is not always a curse. Sometimes your best friend is Judas. Was that too heavy? I should have warned you before I went there, right? I'm, I'm, I'm going to show you that. I'm going to show you that from the Bible. Now, don't worry. It's actually in the Bibles. I'm going to show you from the Bible. Here's the thing about the value between. So, so the pastor wrote and he said, on the first day we opened church, uh, we had a full auditorium of 400 people in a theater. His wife said, we maxed out our credit cards. We gave all our money to hire the equipment and hire the auditorium. And we had a great church service, but we didn't have money to have lunch afterwards. How many of you are happy somebody wrote that part of the story? How many of you are happy that sometimes when that part's left out, it makes everybody else feel like they've got a cheaper faith? And why wouldn't people just be honest about every victory came with a lot of fighting? And there's a necessity for us, we play the wrong game in church when we try to teach people that it all happens perfectly and not show them that even in the darkest moment, the Lord is my shepherd and I shall not want. And that included in his shepherding is deep valleys and dark moments. And we have to take that away from judging the quality of our faith and realizing your faith is still strong even in the ups and in the downs. God still has a plan in the purpose and in the process. And your mind can be terribly scarred if you think that every negative experience is God trying to tell you something negative about you. I always tell the story, those of you who've been around for a while, of our Stanley Street days, you know, and then how we moved from the Stanley Street days to here and all the victories and all the celebration. There were some dark moments. Is it okay if I acknowledge that right now? There were days when we had to borrow money from someone in the churches in the service right now and promise to pay him back after X number of months. And I had to phone my dad and say, Dad, I, you need to help me here. He's like, Where, wh why? I said, because I prayed and Jesus gave me your number. And he said, and he said, no, you had my number. Jesus didn't say anything to me. I'm going to lose. Uh, and, and we had to borrow from here and pray about that and talk to that and have fasting and prayer and supplication. And if you don't hear both sides of the story, you might think there's something wrong with you. The truth is there's something wrong with the way the faith story has been told. We have omitted the bitter bits because we think that that's somehow discouraging. But why don't we just tell you that there is bitterness on the table of communion? You need to know the Jewish history about that. When the, when the Passover meal was shared, there were bitter herbs that were taken and put on the bread. And you ate bitter herbs to remind you that the story of victory included some tough moments. And perhaps one of the most powerful examples of that in the Bible is Joseph's story. Joseph is the one story in the Bible where you hear all the ups and downs. He's planning to marry one person, he gets given another. He runs from that. Well, I mean, it starts out with his brothers saying, I don't need you in a pit. And then some... Thieves come around and go, hey, I can make money from you. So take him out and sell him. 
And then in the midst of him serving in a house, he works seven years for a wife and then gets the wrong one. Works another, you know, has, now he's got two. It's very complicated. I, I don't know. I don't encourage it. Just one in Jesus' name. Now he thinks his life's good. Then his life's a struggle. And, and then it, it's a journey. And then another journey. And then uh, he's working in the household and the master's wife fancies him. And she goes after him and he leaves his coat behind and runs. Lands up in jail. Speaks to some people in jail. They say, when I get out of here, I'm going to get you out too. They get out, they forget about him. It could work. It isn't going to work. This is the best business idea. It didn't work out. I thought that was perfect, but it isn't. I was going to partner with that guy, but that partnership never worked out. I tried that relationship, and I thought it was God's will, but look what's happened. And with every up and down, the key is made. And it would be discouraging if you thought that all of our spiritual journey was just one big success after another, and we celebrated only that. That's photoshopped faith. That is not real. That is not real. And let me tell you why that's so important, because having a vision is not enough. I'm feeling a little charismatic today. I'm going to try and calm myself down. But I am so frustrated at hearing how gifted people are. If you're not going to surround your gift with some sort of structure, you can't be gifted and unreliable. You can't be gifted and inconsistent. You can't, well, you can be, but nobody needs that. See, the reason why God has a plan for your heart and a plan for your mind is you're a solution to somebody. As long as you're a solution, people will send for you. Can you say amen? As long as you're a solution, people will send for you. The moment you're no longer a solution and more a problem, people don't need that. Joseph in Genesis chapter 41 verse 13 and things turned out exactly as he interpreted them to us. And and this is Someone telling a story about Joseph. I was restored to my position and the other man was impaled. Uh, Long story. And Pharaoh sent for Joseph and he was quickly brought from the dungeon. And when he had shaved, I, I, I won't physically do that yet, but when he had shaved and changed his clothes, he came before Pharaoh. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, I had a dream and no one could interpret it, but I have heard it said of you that when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. Two things I want to share about that, and then I'm going to go into my three points. First of all, when you get called into an opportunity, get dressed appropriately. That's not the time to go before Pharaoh and say, I've been in your dungeon for years, look at me. I'm falsely accused. Look how weak I am. He walked in there having forgotten completely that minutes before he was in a prison. Don't drag your negativity into your opportunity. Whatever it took to get you there, leave it behind and Get dressed and clean up. I wish I could tell that to so many young people, particularly concerning your opportunity. I get it that you didn't get the passes you'd hoped for, that your degree cost more than you planned, that your background was, didn't set you up as well. But if you're at the door of opportunity, you leave all of that stuff behind. Nobody in your future should pay for your past. Jesus already did that. Don't make people do a double payment. Don't make your future pay for your past. Don't make your wife pay for your past relationships. Now you're dragging your ex into every conversation because you don't want to man up to be the man that this situation requires. You don't want to shave and clean up to present yourself in the opportunity God's given you so you're looking to something in the past to say, that's why. And when Jesus said, this is who I am by the grace of God, I am suited perfectly for this opportunity. I receive it in Jesus' name. Get your mind right about that. 
And then the second thing, and this is where I want to get practical today, is the idea that it wasn't the fact that Joseph could have dreams or find out about dreams. It was his ability to interpret dreams that got him opportunity. Interpreting a dream is the actual gift. Having a dream is not the gift. Well, let, let, me, let me get practical about that. People come to me and say, uh, uh, Pastor George, I've got a dream to be a pastor like you. Amazing. Wonderful. What, what, are, we, what are you going to do? I'm going to pastor the largest church in the country. Awesome. Interpret that for me. What are you studying? Where are you serving? How are you helping? What are you doing about it in an interpretation and an action that makes me believe that you're not just a dreamer, but you're also a doer? Because having a dream is no guarantee of fulfilling one. Being able to interpret a dream and put around that dream a system that will make the dream come to pass is the gift. People don't like that. People like God will make a way. You know? People come to me quite often. Sometimes, every now and then we get criticized, you know? Every now and then. I told you a few weeks ago, I was like someone on Facebook was, you are the Antichrist. Which is like a very bad, he's not going to be Greek. Wrong theology. But it was another pastor, you know? So not, but, but, but here's the thing, I have a lot of peace about that because I've realized nobody doing better than me criticizes me. Critics criticize what they don't have. Always. If you don't have a BMW, you criticize a BMW. Can, can we just, all the BMW people just say amen? <laughs> you don't have a Mercedes, you criticize the Mercedes. Horrible car, terrible car. Till you have one, fantastic car. <laughs> Haters hate what they don't have. That's how it works, isn't it? Until you have one, and then it's amazing. So here's the thing about structure. People say to me all the time, even when they want to criticize, they're like, oh, well, if I had lights and uh, the hazer and whatever, I'd also have thousands of people coming to church. Okay. Go hire a hall, stick some lights and a hazer, and phone me. You'll have thousands of bills, is what you're going to have. Because unless you have a strategy that is designed to honor God, none of the other stuff makes any sense at all. Your strategy will fail, but you'll sit there with a dream, drawing pictures of yourself on a stage, how fantastic you are. Get down to work, please. Less dreaming, more working. Okay, I'm going to stop. This sermon is not, it's, I'm losing you, I can see. I'm going to just tell you that God's going to bless your day today. No matter what you want, He's going to give it to you miraculously. In the parking lot, you're going to trip over a million rand and <laughs> <coughs> probably sue me. Three, three, <laughs> three, I'm being mischievous. Three, three important lessons about getting your mind right to accept both the uphills and the downhills. First of all, you need to appreciate that struggle is your friend. Struggle is your friend. Let me read you the scripture that I teased you about earlier. Matthew 26 and verse 48 says, Now the betrayer had arranged a signal with them, saying, The one I kiss is the man. Arrest him. Going at once to Jesus Judas said, greetings, rabbi, and kissed him. Jesus replied, do what you came for, friend. Then the man step, men stepped forward and seized Jesus and arrested him. With that, one of Jesus' companions reached for his sword, drew it out, and struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Put your sword back in its place, Jesus said, for all who draw the sword will die by the sword. Do you not think? I cannot call on my father. And you will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels. But how then would the scripture be fulfilled that said it must happen in this way? Let, let me tell you why that's such a powerful scripture. Some of the stuff that you've gone through, it had to happen in that way. 
We have great strategies in our church, but I didn't develop those strategies in prayer. I developed those strategies because somebody criticized. Somebody kissed me on the cheek and said, I'm never coming back to your church because nobody visited me when I was in hospital. I don't get upset. Friend, come and do what you need to do. It has to happen in that way. It made me go back to the office and go, never again will somebody who needs a visit at a hospital not get one. What's the strategy we need that comes out of the struggle? Stop resisting the struggle. It's revealing the strategy. Most people really battle with this idea, the, the feeling that a, a blessed business always goes well. No, a, a blessed business will go well, but the struggles in it are designed to reveal to you something that must happen that way. And as long as you keep problem solving, you're going to be successful. Keep solving the problems. And can I just, this is not a prophecy and I hope it doesn't disappoint you, but the richer you get, you simply have problems on another level. So no clapping for that one. <laughs> nah. No, I'm, I'm, I'm teasing, I'm teasing. You just have problems on another level. At first, you do problem solving. Here's the principle I want to share with you. You are an answer looking for a problem to solve. Stop being a problem looking for an answer. Next sermon series is just going to be sunshine and flowers. I promise you, I'm done with this harshness. I'm done. I'm over it. The second, the second principle I want to share with you is that having a vision only becomes fruitful when you can develop a strategy around the vision. Why is this a mind thing? You have to think about it. People often say, I, I, I'm sitting with pastors, you know, it's like this pastors are a weird breed, you know, they're just they're strange people. And pastors are like, George, I'm, I'm, I'm sure you must sleep really, really well, great things happening in your church and whatever, rumors and stories of excitement. I don't get any sleep. I'm lying awake thinking, what are we going to do when the parking lot's too full? Are we going to buy this building or buy the whole complex? What's the strategy that God wants? You see, he downloaded the dream but he wants you to keep your mind clear to develop a strategy. And if you don't have a strategy, please don't blame God for not fulfilling the dream. He gave you the dream so you would run with it. Write the vision down so that they that read it can run with it. Got to run, 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 run. I see some people fulfilling their dreams so slowly. You're going to need to live 400 years to fulfill the dreams you've got in your file. The files and files of vision, but very slow pace, very slow pace. What's the strategy? It's a critically important thing. You have to let go of some things in order to walk in the strategy of better things. You have to do that. I know my pastor examples are personal to me, but I think you'll be able to practically interpret them in your business and in your life and in your family. If somebody comes to me and says, George, I'm looking for a church where the pastor can come have dinner with me perhaps once a month or we could bride together. or like I'm like, here's three churches I suggest. No, no, I'm not being rude. I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to be able to meet that expectation. And if I try to meet that expectation, I step out of the strategy necessary to fulfill the vision that God has placed in my heart. That strategy won't achieve this outcome. I wonder how many people live like that. George, I want a marriage that just honors God. Is your marriage strategy going to produce a God-honoring outcome? Because the strategy is up to you. Do you know what Joseph was so good at? He didn't just say there are seven fat cows and seven skinny cows. The seven fat cows mean there will be seven years of blessing. The seven skinny cows mean there will be seven years of drought. Do you know what he said? Here's what you should do. During the seven good years, take one-fifth of all your crops, go build a barn, and go put that stuff in the barn so that in the seven years when you don't have, we can go to the barn and we can put that on the table. And do you know what the king of Egypt, Pharaoh of Egypt said? You're in charge. 
because your strategy makes sense in the interpretation of the vision. <laughs> strategy makes sense. The strategy makes sense. I want to encourage you to develop a strategy that makes sense for the vision in your heart. Listen to Matthew 16, 21. It's, um, you'll see. From that time, Jesus began to show to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised the third day. And then Peter took him aside and began to correct him or rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord. This should not happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You're an offense to me, for you're not mindful of the things of God, but of the things of men. I use that scripture because it's amazing that he said, to Judas, you are my friend. And to Peter, you're the voice of Satan. And do you know why? Because Peter was trying to tell him, you're not going to suffer. That's just not going to happen to you. And do you know what Jesus said? Don't believe in a faith that includes no struggle. That's the voice of Satan. You're not mindful of God's ways. That's why you're talking like that. Don't have a faith that appeases you that says, there won't be any struggle. There won't be a fight to fight. There won't be any opposition. There'll never be a contract that fails or even a Christian business partner who disappoints you. Let me tell you, sometimes that can be the biggest struggle. I heard one pastor the other day who said, if he's in a business meeting and the businessman wants to start the meeting in prayer, he's already suspicious. He's like, he's suspicious. He's like, no, 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 let's just see the contract. Can we just see the wording of the contract, please? Because if you're starting out in prayer, I'm a bit worried. Why do we need Jesus here to solve whatever we're going to solve here? I know he's being cynical, but here's what Jesus is reminding us of, that our faith includes a fight, and it's a fight we're going to win. But don't let people talk you out of it and say, pull you aside and say, nothing bad is ever going to happen. And don't let anybody say to you, that when you've gone through some struggle, God wasn't with you. Sometimes, sometimes things have to happen that way. I know that some people here have suffered a loss you can't understand, and I don't want to minimize that. You've lost a loved one, or you've been frustrated by something. You've lost everything, and you can't grasp how to join those dots. And I never want to make a joke of that, but I do want to encourage you on the appropriate time, on the third day, things will resurrect again. And there is a resurrection story for every situation in your life. A lost child or a lost business or a lost life, he is the king of restoring things that have once been stolen. Can you say amen to that? <laughs> Finally, be a solution. I want to encourage you to develop a solution mindset. And solutions are all about perspective. The way you see something is a solution rather than a problem. A perspective is when you look into a situation to be able to determine that there is a positive outcome, not just a negative one. We've been taught in the world we live in to see things from a negative point of view. But there's positive growth also. Can you say amen to that? And it's a perspective that can either darken your whole soul or bring light to your whole soul. I remember I shared this story uh, before. I have a neighbor a few houses from me. We both love our gardens. We both trying to do a bit of work. I bumped into him the other day, a couple of months ago. We just had some rain. I said, how good is it that we've had some rain? He said, yeah, but now the weeds are growing. Like walked away like a proper charismatic speaking in tongues. You know? Of course. Uh, so, so sometimes the evidence of rain is that the weeds grow. <laughs> it's okay. Be solution oriented. Matthew 6, 22. It's just before that part of the scripture that everybody knows. Matthew 6, 33. I'm testing you. 
It says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these other things will be added unto you. But before he gets there, he says, the lamp of the body is the eye. If therefore your eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your perspective, your whole body will be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness. It's your eye, the perspective of something. Perhaps this morning what I need to ask God to do is to purge our eyes spiritually, so we can see biblically and discover something supernaturally. 20 odd years ago, I don't remember, not that long ago, 10 years ago. <laughs> I sound like a really old man now today. I've got two minutes, that's a miracle, all by itself. 10 years ago, I got frustrated by church, not just the one I was in, but the one I was in charge of. I thought it was outdated, antagonistic, judgmental. I was its pastor. So I handed it over. And I prayed to the Lord. I said, Lord, I can't do this church thing because I think churches do more harm than good. My head was not right then. Don't agree. It's like, yes, amen. Churches are terrible. <laughs> and I was so frustrated because young people wouldn't come to church. Divorced people were too scared to come to church. Struggling people were too embarrassed to come to church. Wealthy people controlled the church. Now that came out too quick. I should have. I repent. I, I didn't like it. And I remember going before God one day and saying, Lord, it's a mess. Your bride is a mess. Just, and it's my fault. I, I messed it up too, so I'm sorry. I'm going to go back to KZN, the land of humidity, <laughs> not milk and honey. Milk and honey is here. <laughs> Don't Photoshop KZN. Don't come with that. Don't Photoshop. No filters. Um, and I so clearly remember the Lord saying, well, maybe I gave you that perspective, so you would start something with that tenderness so that you could be a solution to the problem you seem so keen to announce. Why don't you take up the core I've put on you, shake loose people's expectations of what church is or isn't, and just start something my way and leave the rest to me. Quit criticizing that and get going on what you've been called to do. Stop focusing on the problem. Just become the solution I have in mind for your part of the world. Start. Start. And I wonder if we would lose opportunity because we can't see it. It's right there in front of us, but we can't see it because we're looking at the other things. Be careful about that because God's destiny comes in unexpected packages. God's destiny could be in an industrial zone, in a warehouse, with no grass in sight unless we glued it down. <laughs> Would you see it if he said, here's the gift? Would you look at it and go, what a great gift? Or would you look at it and go, wrong delivery address? I started this morning using an example I want to end with. A key is a piece of steel that has been shaped by a lot of ups and downs until it finds the lock it has been crafted for. When it unlocks that, you live in the destiny God has called you for. Can you say amen to that? Would you please stand? Please don't go anywhere uh, for the next minute. I'd love to pray, unless you're part of coffee shop or connections lounge. And I'd lo really love to invite you to consider serving in our dream team. Every year we get to sort of the middle of the year and as people's lives change and others transfer out of town and so on, those areas always need a bit of help. I'd love to have your support in every space. Think about it. Think about serving till the end of the year. I'd love to pray with you last week. 
some people committed their lives to the Lord. And I'd like to pray the same prayer again. I've asked production to put up the prayer on the screens. If you pray this production, this um, salvation prayer uh, at any service, would you please come to the front after the service and let us know. We'll go and collect one of the hello cards and stick your details on there. Let us know. We'd love to email you some information. If you don't have a Bible, we'd love to give you one. But would you close your eyes for a moment and before I pray a prayer that God would refocus our sight, I'd like to take a moment to just ask you if you're in a space in your life where you need to make the transition to follower of Jesus Christ, not only inquirer or spectator or considerer, but follower. If that's the space you're in today, I'd be honored to be able to pray this with you. And if you would let me know, just simply raise your hand long enough for me to see it. And then we'll pray together. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Just long enough to say, I need to be a follower. I need to close the distance, the following distance between me and him. Just raise your hand. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Would you open your eyes with me for a moment? The whole church, especially those who put your hand up. Would you pray this prayer uh, together with me? We're going to do it together as a church on the count of three. I guess it's the easiest way to do it. And then after that, I'll pray a prayer over us all. But if you pray this prayer, please let us know. Could, could we do it on the count of three? One, two, three. Lord God, the Bible says, if I confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe that God raised him from the dead, I will be saved. I believe and I confess that Jesus is the Lord and Savior of my life. Thank you for saving me. Amen. Father, I thank you for a focused mind today. I thank you for a faith that's not photoshopped, that includes the conflicts and the challenges and the struggles and the fights, and that there's nothing wrong with our faith when we go through it. They're all shaping us toward a destiny and a plan. Please keep us strong. And when we're not sure and insecure and fearful, would you help us take a hold of your hand and trust the process that in the end, there'll come a resurrection day. And we honor you and thank you for it in Jesus' name. And everyone said, could you give God a shout of praise and thanksgiving and spend the morning with us, everybody. Warehouse One for great coffee. Stick around. Go to a merchandise store. Get your worthy tickets. Thank you.